the namaste mindset is easy. It's easy to see your your bestie and to say namaste, to see your cat <laughs> or your dog and to say namaste. Those situations is where it's easy. But when you're thinking of the people that may be uh, difficult in your life, when you're thinking of maybe a relative or a politician or a coworker or somebody who maybe did something to you that's inconsiderate, maybe it's a stranger. It's hard to feel namaste and that there's nowhere that God is not. So I'm going to um, share a story that illustrates this namaste mindset or the power uh, of it when applied to challenging people. And this is a story by, uh, a short story by uh, Pema Chodron. And Pema uh, Chodron, uh, a Buddhist teacher, uh, she tells the story of someone named Gurchev. And Gurchev is a spiritual teacher who had a thriving spiritual community. And there was a student in his community who was really ill-tempered. Nobody in the community could stand this guy because he was just so overly sensitive and prickly. And every little thing caused this guy to spin off into a tantrum. Everything irritated him. He complained constantly. So everyone felt the need to tippy-toe around him. People just wished he would go away. But the, the teacher, Gurchev, liked to make his students do things that were completely nonsensical and meaningless at times. And one day he made about 40 people wander through the lawn of the facility and cut sections of the lawn out and move them way to the other side of the lawn for no reason at all. <laughs> and this was just too much for the irritable student. It was the last straw of the, that irritable student. And this guy just blew up, stormed out, got in his car, drove off. He was done. But then everyone there broke out into spontaneous celebration. Yay, he's gone. People were thrilled. They were so happy he was gone. I mean, do you know anybody like that? But when the teacher, Gurchiff, found out what had happened, he said, oh no. And he went off in his car to go to find the student. Three days later, three days later, they both came back. That night when Gurchiff's assistant was sitting with him, he asked, sir, why did you bring the student back? And Gurchiff answered in a very low voice. He said, you're not going to believe this but just between you and me, and you must tell no one, I pay him to stay here. <laughs> so he pays the student to stay here because of the teachings this difficult guy is gonna bring to this community. Because if you're in a community where everything is roses all the time, you're not gonna learn compassion as quickly. So I say that everyone in your life is there to help you. And I believe that this help is nothing short of God in disguise as the people in your life. You know, it's easy to keep on thinking about a beautiful image, meditating on God. But when it, when God shows up as a difficult person in your life, it's hard to see that as God. But this is the teaching moment. This is the teaching uh, opportunity. Last year, I received some guidance in the form of, a, of Tut. Uh, the email newsletter called Tet, a note from the universe. And it said, whether it's obvious or not, David, and it's usually not obvious, everyone in your life is there to help you. And they're actually doing so right now. Tally-ho, the universe. <laughs> I love that, um, that sign off. But often the most challenging people and relationships are accompanied by the greatest gifts, the greatest gifts. They're there to remind us of this namaste consciousness, which is really, it's really Christ consciousness. And I like to think of it on a spectrum. So think of namaste on the spectrum of tolerance, 
You may begin with tolerance and shift to understanding and then shift to compassion. And I begin with tolerance because sometimes that's the only place you can begin. If it's someone that irritates you, your body, your nervous system is taking over, your mammalian self is taking over, and you're, you're um, not able to even think rationally. But the skill to consider is this. When that happens, allow that person safe passage through your mind. Safe passage through your mind. And that doesn't necessarily mean forgiveness. That doesn't mean that you have to rent space to that person up in your head. It just means safe passage as they're passing through. I love that. Uh, another skill is to go neutral. Go neutral. Avoid fighting. Avoid arguing. Don't react. Just stay neutral and stay aware of what strings are being pulled in you. And as you stay neutral, You don't become a party to the struggle, which is perhaps what your mammalian selves are seeking. They're seeking some sort of a struggle. You go to neutrality so you can, so some sort of a, a metamorphosis can happen. So we've talked about tolerance. Those are the two tolerance steps that I have in mind. But now I'd like to talk very quickly about understanding. And it's really seeking to understand with curiosity. So when you're uh, thinking about somebody or interacting with somebody that may be frustrating, stay curious and don't seek to understand intellectually. And, and the reason is that what's occurring may be appropriate for them, completely appropriate for them in that moment. I learned this from uh, Dr. David Bruner. What's occurring for them in that moment is appropriate for them in that moment. And what's occurring for you in that moment is completely appropriate for you in that moment. So all the rationality cannot explain what's going on. You cannot fully understand their struggle. I read, Dennis, don't get mad at me, but I read on Facebook the other day, <laughs> when you finally learn that a person's behavior has more to do with their own internal struggle than with your life, you learn compassion. When you finally learn a person's behavior, when it, that a person's behavior has more to do with their own internal struggle than with your life, you learn compassion more quickly. Further, there is uh, an area of therapy called DBT, Dialectical Behavioral Therapy. And it teaches something wonderful. It's called there can be two truths. Logical thinking, you know, the way we were grew up, we, we grew up is if I win the fight, they lose the fight. If they win the fight, I lose. It's a zero sum game. Winners and losers. But changing this thinking to there can be two rights based on the fact that there can be two truths. And if it's more than one person arguing about something, there can be many truths. And, and this is so beautiful because it takes out the I'm right and they're wrong. It takes, it, it's, you're, you're honoring that there is some truth on both sides of the fence. And this, this reminds me of Rumi when Rumi says, out beyond ideas of right and wrong, there is a field, I'll meet you there. This is really namaste consciousness. And to me, it's moving from, from IQ to EQ, from, from intellectual intelligence to emotional intelligence, which is really what the world needs so desperately right now. We've already proven that we can you know, take I, A, uh, AI data and get as much data as possible and perhaps as much intelligence, but is that intelligence seated in the heart? Is it emotionally intelligent? Is it empathetically intelligent? Is it eth ethically intelligent? So that's where I, I invite us to sink from here to here. And that thinking goes outside of the rational mind at times. It goes to this land of there can be two rights. So I want to kind of drill down on compassion just a little bit now. 
So we talked about understanding and tolerance. And now I want to talk about compassion, which I want to begin with the triad of kindness, which you've all heard before, sympathy, empathy, and compassion. There are lots of definitions, but I like to say that sympathy is, um, I'm sorry that happened to them. But empathy goes further in that there is a real understanding of, I've been there. I, I feel what they're feeling. I feel, you know, we as empaths, it's, it's often said that we as spiritual people often are empaths. We feel what they're feeling. And it can be problematic sometimes because we feel it so much. But that's where we lead ourselves to compassion, which is one step further, which is in the knowledge that I am them. They are me. We are one. I, I want to strive to relieve their suffering. And that drives us to action. So the, the, the Buddhist principle uh, of compassion and the, the, the meta prayer, um, may all beings be happy, may all beings be at peace, may all be free from suffering, may all be free from pain. There's lots of variations of it, but the, the role of the Bodhisattva as the role of Christ is to see the suffering and to alleviate the suffering. And in Buddhism, the Bodhisattva won't even go to enlightenment until all other beings have crossed the gate, until all other beings have a cessation of suffering. And that is compassion. And there are many ways that we can show compassion. And one of those ways is simply through prayer. Now, there are many people in this room that are from a unity uh, education and from a, a religious science education, um, but both, both forms of prayer hold these two things when we're talking about uh, praying for someone else. It is, God is all there is, and it is seeing God in the person that we're praying with, praying for. It is seeing them as the perfect divine being that they are. So this is compassion. I uh, I want to close with a couple of things. And one, one is um, a few years ago, I was watching a documentary on the Mayo Clinic. And the Mayo Clinic began as a partnership between a hospital and the Sisters of St. Francis. And the Sisters of St. Francis talked about the level of care that they give someone. And the doctors and the nuns and the staff held the belief as they do today that they are to treat each patient as if they were Jesus himself. Nothing less. That's compassion. And finally, Mother Teresa exemplified this kind of thinking when she said, what is my thought? I see Jesus in every human being. I say to myself, this is hungry Jesus. I must feed him. This is sick Jesus. This is the one that has leprosy or gangrene. I must tend to them. So this is Christ consciousness. This is namaste consciousness. This is the namaste mindset that I think we all need at this time. We can develop it as a spiritual practice. So I invite us to just seal this knowledge and seal this moment with the prayer. I found this reading and it says, my soul honors your soul. I honor the place in you where the entire universe dwells. I honor the light the love, the truth, the beauty, and the peace in you because it is also within me. And in sharing these things, we are one. Namaste. And so it is. And Jesse, I'm going to spotlight you. Beautiful. Thank you, David. There in the 
center of my soul I can feel it all around me something holy and untold but I hear it Please. 